Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for Water and Wealth. I am Carrie Bickford. I am the Director of Programs at Philadelphia Contemporary and one of the many co-curators of Commonwealth. Commonwealth is a collaborative project developed by three arts organizations in three American Commonwealths. Betelo Call in San Juan, Puerto Rico, the Institute for Contemporary Art at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia, and Philadelphia Contemporary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This project seeks to investigate the history, utopian potential, and limitations of the term commonwealth. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to let everyone joining us today know that this webinar will provide live Spanish interpretation with our interpreters Cristobal Guerra and Paul Lebron. To access that Spanish interpretation, please press the button labeled interpretation at the bottom of your Zoom webinar toolbar. Our interpreters will also be writing instructions on how to access that channel in the chat for everybody. This webinar will provide live captioning in English by Susie Galvin. To access those captions, please press the button labeled closed caption at the bottom of the Zoom webinar toolbar. This webinar also offers live captioning in Spanish at a stream text link. I will drop that link into the chat right now. I also want to thank the William Penn Foundation and Virginia Commonwealth University for their support of Commonwealth. And last but certainly not least, I want to introduce our two panelists for this evening, Carolina Caicedo and Dr. Mary Ebeling. Carolina Caicedo is a London-born Colombian artist who currently lives in Los Angeles. She participates in movements of territorial resistance, solidarity economies, and housing as a human right. Carolina's artistic practice incorporates performances, drawings, photographs, and videos, not just as an end result, but as a part of the artist's process of research and action. Her work, Distressed Debt, was jointly commissioned as part of Commonwealth and is currently on view in the ICA VCU galleries in Richmond. Dr. Mary Ebeling is Associate Professor of Sociology at Drexel University. Mary is an ethnographic sociologist who researches the intersections of marketing, health, biomedical science, and digital life. Her 2016 book, Healthcare and Big Data, Digital Specters and Phantom Objects, focuses on data brokers, data mining, marketing surveillance, private health data, and algorithmic identities. As our panelists are presenting, please feel free to submit any questions you may have by using the Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar. We will be taking audience questions after both of the panelists present. And without any further delay, it's my pleasure to pass the virtual microphone to Carolina. Thank you, Kerry, and thank you, Mary, so much for being in conversation with me. Also, thanks for the interpreters for offering that service today, and of course, to the closed captions. I am going to share my screen and um, Stop my video too. <clears throat> so there you go. Um, Carrie, does that look good? Can you just give me a good to go to make sure that that's looking good? I guess so. All right. Um, so public utility and site development bonds, including water, energy, electrical, sewage, and infrastructure bonds that have been traded since the late 1800s as part of the bond market, a financial market also known as debt market, <clears throat> excuse me, or credit market, where participants can issue new debt or buy and sell debt securities. This is usually in the form of bonds, but it may include notes, bills, and so on. So what we're looking at is a bond from at that point called the South Puerto Rico Sugar Company. We see the main document on the left and then we see the um, kind of the bond tickets uh, that have to be cashed, uh, you know, every month or every year, according to the bond, um, the bond kind of time schedule. Water and other utility bonds are resources from diverse capital markets for the execution of water related and infrastructural projects. They have the same principle than other bonds where an issuer raise a fixed amount of capital, repaying the capital and accrued interest over time. 
while it appears as a funding mechanism that governments, municipalities, and agencies assume to develop water or energy infrastructure projects that we should say mostly benefit extractive industries, it does contribute to the privatization of public utilities by commercializing a human right as a commodity. With global demand for common goods such as water expected to explode in the coming years or actually happening right now, fund managers are recommended investing in bonds as long-term bet on an essential commodity whose supplies are limited. Under the present worldwide uncertain circumstances brought by COVID-19, we see a surge of governmental reach in all aspects of society. In more right-wing governments, heavier surveillance and the distribution of public funds in favor of corporations and first-class citizens have been experienced. In leftist-oriented leftist governments, a universal basic income or the nationalization of private hospitals and healthcare providers are being implemented. Either way, this reinforcement of governmental power does not necessarily mean a reinforcement of what is public nor of the commons. As quarantined citizens, we seem to have less participation in decision-making, mutual aid ne networks and local communal processes waiting instead for the administration government to take action. In the same fashion as the 2008 recession, after the sanitary and economic crisis peaks, we can expect a colossal creation of unlimited financial credit with low interests, a huge amount of debt that grows faster than the GDP. Most probably bond debts will be issued as part of these credit lines. And actually in the current California ballot, we are voting on both measure double R that would approve 7 billion in bonds for school upgrades and safety measures. Though none of that money would go to increase uh, teacher salaries, for example. And we're also voting on measure 14, which would authorize 5.5 billion state bonds for STEM research and medical training um, with payments, uh, you know, bond returns for the next 30 years. Bonds are expanding their influence in a financial structure where governmental agencies and municipalities assume a ridiculously high interest debt. The issuer will need to gener generate cash flow to repay interest and capital. Water bonds or other infrastructure bonds have massive failures all around the world. The municipalities and governmental agencies pay high interests, affecting their finances critically, and the infrastructure is not executed. In the case of Puerto Rico, for example, it emphasizes a colonial status, resulting in Puerto Rico having more than 15 times the median bond debt that the other 50 states in the United States, arriving to a situation known as distressed debt. When an, and distress, distressed debt is when an entity is in a, in a financial distress and the original holders of the issued securities sell them to new buyers at a significantly discounted price. That's when hedge funds, also referred as to vulture funds, which Puerto Rico knows very well, or bottom feeder funds specialize in acquiring these bond debts, pushing governments to improve tax collection and reduce public spending in order to keep up with interest payments. And that's what has happened in Puerto Rico and in, you know, more, uh, with more visibility after Hurricane Maria where schools were closed, um, hospitals were closed in favor of paying bond debt. So the language and concepts used in bonds are very particular to financing, but could be related to other kind of processes. And we see in, in the text of these bonds, words such a, a term such as face value, maturity date, accuracy of certain representations, redemption, subordinate, continuing compliance. Furthermore, utility bonds include language related to infrastructure, particular projects, and sometimes uh, the overall history of the public utility system itself. 
Though most bonds today are issued electronically, historical bonds, note, notes and bills took shapes as physical certificates, which is what I've been um, showing you uh, in the screen right now. Um, and they, they have a particular official aesthetic that favors letterheads, city shields, insignias, ornate borders, imprints, signatures, vignettes that range from animals to architecture to personality. Ironically, with a, you know, with a debt condition of Puerto Rico, all paper historic Puerto Rican bonds right now um, are in demand as collectibles due to the current financial crisis actually. So I've been showing you, um, you know, different kind of um, bonds from different time periods um, uh, from the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, like these ones from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, city issued by the city of Philadelphia, issued by the Virginian Railway, actually a very old Confederate States uh, loan or bond. And then these ones um, that I found as part of the research, uh, which are actually slave bonds issued in the late 1700s. This is actually a bond from 1795. Um, and I, I guess we will speak about that later uh, it, with more in more depth. But basically the first bond uh, to appear in uh, the American market are actually slave bonds where the enslaved bodies of black people were used as collateral to, um, for the debt. Um, and it's interesting to see this initial bonds uh, where you see um, you know, already the seals appearing and here's some sort of ornate border appearing or even in this one uh, that's a, a kind of older, the 1795 bond, you, know, you have a seal here that's not you know, printed but it's actually like kind of drawn. And you see this is the back of the bond and you see the same format um, uh, of folding the bonds, the same format that bonds are folded today. Um, you know, already seen in this original here, you see the word bond. So this is an image of the installation at ICA at the Virginia University in Richmond. Um, the installation is called Distressed Debt. It consists of these five printed panels of uh, silk and cotton. Um, so there are a series of digital collages printed on these fabrics uh, that evidence the symbolic quality and power structure of the imagery and the language construct of bond certificates. Um, visuals, words, and phrases um, are extrapolated from the original documents and are used to create a palimpsest that provides a layered account of how debt has been historically created and how water and other common goods are privatized using financial schemes. So uh, that being said, I'm gonna pass um the mic to dr mary <laughs> thank you um, i hope that i can um i see so many connections uh between what caroline and carolina has been um sharing with us about her work um and what i'm going to be talking about today um so let me also i'm going to stop my video and start sharing my screen And can I get a thumbs up from Carrie uh, in the chat? I, or I'm not quite sure. Um, but I'm hoping that you can see that I'm showing a, a Google map. Um, can I, um, let's see if I can. Okay, so I'm hoping that you can see a Google map um, of the 
uh, Schuylkill River. And I'm going to be talking about... Um, Mary, we can't see anything yet. Oh, you can't see anything yet. Okay, hold on. Um, hmm. Try again, share screen. <sighs> Dear. Um, Do you want to try, try sharing while you have your video on Mary and see if that helps? Yeah, maybe that will make the difference. Okay. All right. Um, Oh, I see. Okay, let's see. Can you see it now? Should be a Google map? Nothing yet. Huh. Um, uh, does someone maybe have to, can we, Share. Yeah. Do you want to forward the Google map to oh, me, Mary? Do you want to drop it in the chat and I no, can screen that, share? No, um, that's not going to work um, because basically okay. I have a whole presentation in Google. Um, uh, do you want to give it one more try, Mary? And if not, perhaps what you could do is drop some of the screen shares into the chat. Everyone can see the chat, all of the public. So if you wanted to, to drop an address that people could Google Maps, you could perhaps talk without the images, but why don't you give it one more try and then we can try dropping them into chat. Okay, let me try again and I think I just lost okay okay can you see that works and can you uh, can you see um the google maps yes perfect okay I'm going to turn off my camera All right, so, okay. Okay, so um, this is going to be a little bit, bit of a meditation. Um, so forgive me on this. Um, before I begin, um, I, I need to thank Paul Kimport, Kiana Ga uh, Ganges and the Ganges family, Calvin Harrington and his brother, and um, Reverend John Norwood, of the uh, Nanakok Leni Lenape Tribal Nation in New Jersey, um, the generations who live in Point Breeze and Grace Ferry, and all of the um, ancestors, past, present, and future, who um, have lived along the Schuylkill River for allowing me to tell the story tonight. Um, and this story is um, about bonds, about debts, bonds, and obligations to make reparations for what has been taken, as well as it's a story about life itself. And I'm going to preface the story um, with two, um, two things. The first one is to, um, to talk about the phantom commodity. The commodity is haunted by the social relations that went into its making. These relations are embedded into its very being. These relations are its being. Without these haunted relations, the commodity does not exist. The Opijiwa water protector warrior woman and present day ancestor, 16 year old Autumn Peltlier, tells us that our existence is water. Without it, we are not possible. We all come from the water in our mother's wombs and that our mothers come from the water in their mother's room, wombs, and so on, as far back and as far and as far forward into the flow of time on this planet. Without water, existence is not possible. 
So I live very close to this area right here is Woodland Cemetery. But historically it was um, a botanical garden, one of the first to be um, uh, founded um, in North America um, before uh, the United States um, became a nation state um, by, John, um, by uh, oh my gosh, by, um, it doesn't matter. Um, and right south um, past this um, bend is Bartram's Garden, which was fa founded around the same time, another um, botanical garden. And this botanical garden is the only continuously running botanical or the oldest um, continuous running botanical garden um, in the United States, founded by John Bartram. Um, okay, so the reason why this is significant um, is every day I see this bend in the Schuylkill River from the Woodlands Cemetery, which is a site uh, that was formerly a collection of life and now in, in the 19th and 20th century has become kind of a, a, a site of collecting life as well as death. And so I see that this, uh, I see this bend virtually every day. Um, and the, the river's bends and edges always change, but so imperceptibly that while my view from this vantage point may change day to day, season to season, um, it becomes a very familiar sight for me, um, a, a place for me to contemplate and to think. Um, I go to the its banks every day to reflect on the intimacies at the level intimacies at the level of the cellular, as well as at the level of the universe, and to think about the gossamer spider webs connected to to others across time and space and through this river, as well as through the liveliness of the commodities that flow on this river and in this river, and things made of life itself. So one of the things that I see quite frequently um, at this site are the oil and fracking trains that traverse the, um, the rail system on, it, on their way from North Dakota across the, uh, the half of the um, continental US um, from North Dakota um, down south, all the way down south to south, the South Schuylkill River. Okay, so the next, and I, I may have lost um, my most important um, image, but I will, Well, I had a video of an of a oil train that I wanted to actually show you, um, but I, I messed it up. <laughs> so, so this bend in, in uh, the river takes us down to across this bridge. Um, and this, these oil trains come across this bridge here. Um, and this bridge connects the woodlands and the, the fracking trains from North Dakota south to Bartram's Garden. Um, these trains cr cross the sovereign lands of the Dakota Lakota, where in 2016, nations from all over gathered to protect the Missouri River's waters from the Black Snake. Which, is, uh, which with its extraction would make the lives of the people of Standing Rock unbearable. Standing Rock was not the first occupation, the first uprising to protect the commonly shared good 
There was also wounded knee, knee Alcatraz, uh, hundreds. Um, to be met with the asymmetrical force and violence of the colonial state that protects the extractive and life-killing force of capital, capital accumulation, of, the, of extracting private wealth through the dis, dispossession of the common wheel. And these rivers and trains connect all of us. These are one of the gossamer threads that connect all of us across this continent. So as I kind of come down, this is, um, we're coming under the, the, the train bridge towards Bartram's garden. Um, and here we are now on the Schuylkill's edge um, at Bartram's garden. And here's the, the bridge again. And people fish. Um, <clears throat> So one of the things that I, I do when I come down to kind of sit and think um, about these uh, relationships is um, I always kind of make a, a point of coming to visit and look at the, the, um, the holes of the, of the refineries, the oil and gas refineries that, are, um, that populate the whole of um, the South Schuylkill and where these trains are destined uh, to um, leave their, their, um, their gas and their, frac and, their, and their crude oil. So one of the things that I think about often when I, when I see these holes is I also think about um, other holes that here are not so visible anymore. Let me see if I have a few more pictures of the holes. Okay, um, but another um, other holes that I think about when I look at these these fracking and gas refining holes um, is a hole that's not no longer present, but um, I sense its presence just the same, and it's the hole of the USS Ganges, thus named for its regular sojourns to Calcutta. That in 1800 captured the two illegal US slave schooners, the Phoebe and the Prudent off the coast of Havana. The schooners crews were sick with yellow fever as were the 135 children who were all aged between five and 17 years old who had been kidnapped from their families off the coast of West Africa where their original kinship bonds were broken. But of course these children's of carried those bonds with them across the Atlantic and which and with these broken bonds had rendered the, these children orphans. When the Ganges uh, captured these ships as prizes of war in the now illegal international slavery trade, the children were taken to the port of Philadelphia and they were held in this Lazarato for 40 days um, to also quarantine because they had yellow fever. These children, um, and this Lazarato still exists today. It's um, just south of Bartram's garden. Being orphans, all of the children were given the last name Ganges and became family these 135 children became family through this surname, a name that symbolizes and immortalizes a loss and trauma so profound that it is unimaginable that any child could have endured and borne all of that by themselves. But the Ganges name forged a bond out of this shared suffering and Ganges' de uh, descendants have a family reunion every year. Um, and though this year they had to postpone it because of the pandemic, but every year they reunite to celebrate the, fam fam um, the family bonds of, kin of a kinship that while born in tragedy and dispossession thrives 220 years on the bonds of solidarity. Across the Lazarato, where the Ganges 
children were convalescing. Um, also sits across the Schuylkill, sits the um, former site of the Philadelphia Energy Solutions Refinery at Point Breeze. And this, this is the refinery um, when it exploded on uh, June, uh, the, around three in the morning on June 21st um, in 2019. The PES refinery, already a place groaning under the weight of debt obligations to its creditors, um, but still in uh, but still operating at full production capacity to process the fracking gases and crude oil coming down from the Keystone XL and Dakota Access pipelines and other pipeline estuaries in the Southern Schuylkill. The explosion uh, forced PES finally into full bankruptcy, but not after letting, um, but the explosion itself spewed the commodities billions of molecules into the night sky. The bones, blood, and cells of every resident of Point Breeze and Gray's Ferry, some of which are possible descendants of, of the Ganges children themselves, are now haunted by this commodity. As its DNA altering benzene and other carcinogenic molecules circulate to their marrow, to their bones marrow, to the tissues of their kidneys, bladders, and livers, to force and coerce their bodies to conform to the logics of capital. The commodity gets into us. We become the ersatz life of itself, which makes our own lives unbearable and literally unlivable. So further up the Google, which I will, so we were down here at Bartram's Garden, the La Serato is a little bit further down. And then here is the, P, uh, the PES uh, refinery that exploded. And then we're gonna go up here, a little bit up the Schuylkill River um, to meet to meet um, two brothers, Calvin and his brother, um, who have been fishing the Schuylkill since they were young boys. Calvin is now 56, so he reckons he's been fishing the Schuylkill for about 45 years. He tells me that it brings him calm and peace. Calvin's older brother tells me that he remembers before King was assassinated, maybe it was about 66 or 67, that the Schuylkill rose up above this highway, flooding with oil, flooding the highway um, with oil and its waters toxic to all of life. Around that time, the Schuylkill was the most polluted river on the continent. Um, oops. The shad, um, the shad was one of the fish that used to, um, oops, to migrate um, up. Uh, the shad had not taken its springtime death journey out of the Atlantic Ocean, up the mouth of the Delaware Bay, swimming the Delaware River north and taking it a side journey up the brackish Schuylkill to the falls, the rocks upstream to where the water turns fresh where they spawn and smash their bodies against the river rocks to feed its young since the 19th century. That's when the river choked by the coal ash and the slurry detritus of the coal production um, that happened in Pottstown upriver had made the shad's life unbearable. Before its 200 year disappearance though, the fish resisted becoming a commodity. It was a fish that was anti-capitalist the Swedish settlers that occupied Fishtown could not coax its meat, the meat of this wild salmon fish, into a marketable commodity. 
Um, Calvin tells me that the Lenape used fish darts festooned with feathers to capture the shad before it spawned and before it disappeared. The shad is coming back, Calvin says. Then he lists all of the fish that he ha has in some way a relationship to. Fish that, ha that have hooked themselves onto his line that he holds in his hands for a, a moment of common, common union in solidarity in a communion of life before throwing them back into the Schuylkill so that they can continue to live. Walleye, bass, striped, large and small, catfish, white perch, yellow perch, crockers, and spots. These are, all, and these two are ocean fish as well as the bass. Other forms of life are coming back. He's seen turtles, red-eared turtles, two bald eagles. His brother chimes in. There was even a dolphin swimming right up here back in 98. I tell Calvin that I myself have seen osprey, red-tailed hawks. I see one almost every day at the woodlands. Eagles, geese, and oh, I wanted to show you. geese who were just um, taking a little respite on their migration um, south, if it will load, um, that I see geese and I see these geese everywhere and pretty much every day now, um, and, and also heron. Um, so, <laughs> I am, um, what I think we should all do um, is to resist being a haunted commodity, to resist being becoming an ersatz revenant, the commodities ersatz revenant, and as if your life depends on it, because it does. The Schuylkill River is alive, and water is life. And just very quickly, I wanted to show this photo of um, Pablo, um, who uh, took a, a walk with me and, and um, other people from Beta Local, Sophia, uh, Michael. Um, this is Emmy, who is an artist who also took a walk with us, and Carlos um, back uh, two springs ago. So I also need to thank. Um, Philadelphia Contemporary and Beta Local for also making this talk um, possible. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and also stop my video. And come back. And I'm really sorry about the, everything worked beautifully when we were testing it and then the adventures, the adventures of being on Zoom. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you, Carolina, for those for those talks. Before I start asking a few of the many questions I have for you both, I do want to encourage our audience to stop start dropping some of their own questions into the Q and A function at the bottom. I'm going to get Mary and Carolina going with just a few, and then I really love to just start letting the audience ask them some of their own questions. So for both of you. One of the main questions at the heart of Commonwealth as we've been starting all of these investigations for years has really been about interrogating the ways in which we define wealth in this country and what it would mean to redistribute that wealth in ways that are more just, ways that are more equitable. When it comes to water, as in public waterways, I think as you're both starting to circle around, there's a very critical question of whether we should be treating water as a form of a commodity or a wealth and the kinds of violence and harm that can be enacted when water and waterways are treated as commodities or entangled with commodities, as you discuss, Mary. I was wondering if you could both speak a little to whether you think it's harmful to think of, to categorize water as a form of wealth, whether you think that's sort of a first step in a harm and what it might mean for water as wealth to be something that we could hold more in common. Mary, for instance, I know you talked about reparations um, at the beginning of your talk. Maybe you could also talk a little bit more about that. Um, do you want me to go first or Carolina? Whichever of you, whichever you feel so moved. Um, Mary, 
I'll just, I'll quickly kind of uh, make a few points. So um, yes, I think that uh, water, water as a commodity is a very violent and a very violent thing um, and um, harmful thing. Um, I, um, and you know, as, as a commodity um, is, um, uh, embodies uh, the social relations that went into its making, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, that kind of a, com a, a commodity um, from water can only be violent. Um, mm -hmm. As we look at the history of, of you know, of extractive industries um, across the world, but also in the United States, they're always uh, violent. Um, and reinforce um, their extraction um, through violence, asymmetrical violence. Um, so uh, someone like Autumn Poutlier says that we should think of water as a person, just like they have um, legally declared um, a river, I think in New Zealand, mm -hmm. as a person to give um, these, uh, com these um, these common public goods, a personhood rather than um, giving them um, something like a commodity status. The notion they have their own sort of inherent rights also. Right, and her inherent rights. Mm -hmm. Carolina, did you have any thoughts on the sort of inherent violence in, in thinking about water as wealth or, or other ways we might sort of come to, to quantify water or talk about water or categorize yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, um, well, you know, the idea of property, you know, and that kind of human um, supremacy, you know, to speak about, you know, how we function in this world, thinking that as humankind, we are over all the other living and non-living entities in this planet, you know, which is a sort of, you know, supremacy, enacted supremacy. Um, you know, the way, you know, it how we call some entities or common goods, na natural resources, already there's a violence in the word resource, you know, because it implies it's there for us to use and peruse however we want. Um, so, so there's violence and, you know, and since the, the way we, we mention it, you know, or we call them these, you know, resources, I prefer to use the word common goods, for example, when referring to natural entities. Um, Definitely the idea of property, you know, that comes with Western cosmovisions and market, you know, Western markets and uh, Western epistemologies, the idea of private property or just being, you know, the master over something, over, you know, land or over water, uh, you know, uh, that that is so much in contravision and in contradiction with indigenous epistemologies from across the Americas, who, as Mary pointed out, understand water as as kin you know mm -hmm. um, and other common goods as kin as family members to to caress to protect um to confront too because you know not all family relationships are you know pink and rosy um uh, and i definitely understand water as a political agent as a political subject too like in latin america for example we are definitely pioneers in granting legal rights to bodies of water. In Colombia, we have the Atrato River as is a subject of rights. And, uh, you know, in the Ecuadorian and the uh, Bolivian constitution, uh, nature is a subject of rights. Um, so for, you know, I and I have experienced also water and rivers in my case, which is kind of where I've been studying more in depth uh, as political subjects with agency with the capacity of change in the course of events, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. And I think something, Carolina, I so appreciated about the way you, you think about bonds and lay out this subject is the way in which you really distinguish common goods as being separate, the notion of common or public as being separate from government run or government held, that those things can intersect, but that they don't necessarily do so. Um, in addition to, of course, sort of corporate holdings of water or rivers and, and that being a sort of different form of violence in terms of how rivers are categorized and held. You've done so much work over the years in terms of rivers and sort of healthy ways in which water is held as kin. I'm wondering if any have sort of 
jumped out at you over the years that are sort of useful as models to move forward in terms of mutual aid societies or ways for just us as citizens to live, citizens and residents to live more healthily in terms of how we live with our own rivers, you know, and, and I think this ties in Mary too with the ways in which you talk about personal healthy ways to sort of incur, encounter the skookle that are outside of the idea of holding it as something that's a commodification. So, so Carolina, to start with you. Yeah, so <clears throat> different examples in Colombia, Brazil, most of them that I've encountered where um, a community in particular understands themselves and relates to a particular body of water, understands themselves as protectors or stewarders. That's mm -hmm. you know the, also the way of the indigenous movement here in in the United States name themselves as protectors, you know, of the land, as protectors of the waters. I mean, and when I we say land, it entails water, sea, forest. No, mm -hmm. it's a complex, you know, geography. <clears throat> Sorry, just not soil. So yeah, I've seen different examples, um, and uh, many of them that are kind of born out of the necessity of organizing to counteract the effects of a, for example, a large hydroelectric. So that's the case of the communities in uh, impacted by the uh, mega hydroelectric of Urra uh, over the Sino River in, in uh, Cordoba, which is a region in Colombia. And um, these communities, um, after they were displaced um, from their kind of wetlands by the Urra mega hydroelectric, organized and um, under different associations, maybe the, the most well known is called Asprosig, mm -hmm. and they um, kind of revitalized indigenous channeling of waters in that wetland from the Senu. A kind of ethnic ethnic group, yeah. and uh, in that way, have built what they de denominate a agroecological spiral, which is self uh, sus sustained, and uh, is based on sustenance um, practices. Where you know, at this point, they produce their own electricity, they produce their own food, they took over the schools. Uh, and kind of ignored the school agenda and brought in by the Ministry of Education in Colombia because they thought that what was being taught there was not in tandem of what the kids needed actually to be stewards of that place. So instead of sitting down and learning algebra, whatnot, they actually are on the field learning how to fish, how to you know grow crops, and how to uh, tend to their solar you know grid that's you know disconnected from the main grid so yeah these are processes that have taken long but you know that surge for example in this case of Asprosig you know they've been working and organizing for almost three decades now yeah. so definitely yeah, they become stewards of, of the land um, they've taken technology in their hands also um, to be able to to have a more equitable and kind of harmonic uh, and balanced relationship with that wetland. Yeah, absolutely. And Mary, when you were sort of doing, thank you, Carolina, for that, for that, the depth of that answer. And Mary, when you were thinking about the fishermen that you were encountering, the people who you were sort of encountering who were having these entanglements with the skookle that were less harmful, that sort of seemed to move past these kinds of di dichotomies and these violences that are enacted when we sort of think of, of water as a form of wealth or as a form of commodity, were there any sort of common grounds that jumped out at you, sort of repeated practices, if it was, you know, you talked about how those fishermen were thinking about indigenous practices and were sort of thinking about historic practices and, and bringing those back. And also there was an attentiveness that really jumped out to me in terms of you talking about the geese that you're seeing and them sort of watching these come, things come back that's important to that. Were there any sort of kind of common practices that were a form of, a form of healing, kind of generating new, more healthy relationships with our bodies of water that really came out to you? Well, um, I mean, I think in general, so there's been um, a, a big effort um, on, on the, I mean, I think that um, fishermen like Calvin and his brother um, take a lot of care um, and, and, and are attentive to um, the health and the life of the, of the river. Um, but there has been um, for years, for decades um, in Philadelphia, 
um, concerted efforts, um, uh, grassroots efforts to um, be uh, river keepers, to, to uh, study and maintain and, and um, um, to study and um, uh, what is the word? Um, I mean, there are river keepers that go to the Schuylkill every day and measure the toxicity level in the water. Yeah. And this has been going on for decades. Um, and these water, these river keepers are very active. Um, and in fact, I will say that I've been uh, kayaking on on the lower Schuylkill, the southern Schuylkill. Schuylkill, I've gone three times now with these kind of uh, river keepers. Yeah. Um, and we've, we've looked at uh, the refineries of, of the South Schuylkill. Um, and they have a lot more knowledge than I have, but yes, I mean, definitely the river keepers, um, there are a lot of um, throughout the city. So I should say a couple of things about um, rain, uh, uh, stormwater runoff and the Schuylkill. So uh, I don't know if you noticed that there was like a drain pipe near where the geese were kind right. of thing. So that, um, that drain pipe is all water that comes from the smaller estuaries and creeks mm -hmm. that feed into the Schuylkill then it eventually feed into the Delaware. In the 19th century, um, the, because of things like yellow fever and disease, the city, um, basically encased the um, uh, places like the Mill Creek, a, a creek, an estuary of the Schuylkill, the Mill Creek, um, encased them to make them sewers. So basically they di diverted all of these smaller rivers and creeks underground um, and became Philadelphia's sewer system. Yeah. So in the 21st century, 20th and 21st century with all this construction, um, when um, the, the sewer runoff runs right into the Schuylkill, and this is part of why it was one of the most polluted rivers in the United States. Um, there has been, um, at the same time, with kind of like Philadelphia being a post-industrial um, city itself and the poorest in, for its size in the United States, um, it has currently about 40,000 vacant lots mm -hmm. and disused buildings. And so there's a huge um, movement in Philadelphia. It's, it's like one of the centers for the food justice movement and urban agricultural movement that reuse these vacant lots and, and grow food um, in order to uh, manage the rain runoff that runs into th these underground rivers and into the Schuylkill. So that's like one of the biggest things that I think is like a, a huge caretaking and kind of a reparative um, way of like repairing and, and re trying to reverse some of the damage that's been done to the Schuylkill and to the life of the Schuylkill and including people, you know, the fishermen and the people that live along the river that are basically being literally poisoned by its waters and by the air around, you know, above its waters. Yeah, that, no, thank you for that. that there's, there's no question of that. And I know that also with a lot of those farming movements, there's, there's such a need to keep land consistently to and let, let, let them have continued access to it to really can build that capacity. I do wanna switch. We've got so many audience questions coming in. I wanna make sure we have time for those. Um, we had somebody ask in terms of commodification, if you see it, if the, both of you see a distinction between salt and freshwater bodies and whether there's kind of any split there and difference in terms of how we think about that question. Well, I, I would definitely say like the, the life that lives in salt and brackish and salt water, you know, has already been commodified. Yeah. You know, like all of the, the fish and, you know, the, I mean, the fisheries, I'm sure, um, I mean, I don't know much about ocean fishing, but I'm sure there are boundaries that are, you know, international boundaries, fishing boundaries and stuff. So in that way, um, salt water has already been kind of commodified and historically probably so. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, Carolina? 
<laughs> yeah, I think both salt water and fresh water have been historically com commodified. Um, now we see operations like deep sea mining. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of one of the new frontiers, if you want to call that nasty name. <laughs> but, you know, just so everyone understands what I mean. That's one of the new frontiers of mining, deep sea mining. And there's a lot of artists and people working around those issues to bring that into attention because that's something that's not really talked about in you know mainstream media or current narratives about mining but that's where people are actually looking at right now um, to to kind of um, massively exploit minerals that are found in the deep sea so so yeah you know um, you know the fact that it, the slave trade market you know we, we can start talking about that you know and the mass movement of commodities uh, happening today through, through you know uh, there's a website, I can't remember how it's called, but you know, if you do a little bit of Google searching, you'll find it where you can actually see the traffic of boats in real time across the sea. And it's just horrible to see how it, it's totally dotted. You know, there's barely a little bit of sea where there's no boat coming and going. And you can distinguish if it's a tanker or it's moving commodities or what is a fishing boat. And it's just, tons and tons and tons of tons of traffic so it's really it's really sad um to see that so i i i mean i see i i guess the only distinction would be kind of in format of how they're being exploited but they're both yeah yeah they're both sites of exploitation yeah and can i just add one teeny tiny thing um also i mean like of course uh, my part of my family comes from southern louisiana and they were all working on the oil rigs out in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so, yeah, that, I mean, um, and um, I think that uh, disused platforms, oil platforms in, uh, there's a proposal in the UK right now um, that um, in to, uh, by the, the, um, the government to use a disused um, oil platforms in the North Sea uh, for um, migrant centers to put people, migrants who are um, because of Brexit no longer allowed to come into the UK to move them to these disused oil platforms in the middle of the North Sea. So. And one of the next questions that came up on our list was someone was, um, and Carolina, you touched on this in your answer the ways in which the current American economy is impacted by the slave-based economy that gave rise to slave bonds and how the generational wealth of black and indigenous people of color has been affected by that slave-based economy and sort of how you crossed that in your bond research. Yeah, I, I didn't have a clue about slave bonds uh, and doing research actually. Um, I came across them through a program of the Virginia Library called Virginia Untold, and they hold uh, the originals that you can access online or not, you know, it was online, uh, original slave bonds from the mid 1700s to the mid 1800s. So um, the market as we know today, um, you know, comes or was originated with um, the trade of slave bonds. And actually the word bond comes from bondage as in slavery, um, you know, um, and it was, you know, to think that it was the black bodies, you know, that were the mac macabre collateral of this first financial trading is, is really abhorrent. And to understand that any company in the United States that was founded before the mid 1800s, which is a lot of our banks, a lot of our railroads, a lot of our, you know, uh, big big stakeholders in, in capital markets and in trade markets, um, you know, made their wealth through slave bonds. So that's the wealth, you know, that's being traded today. Um, and um, this happened because in, in colonial times, you know, um, land didn't have that much. Um, um, worth it was it was you know the the slaves had the you know to hold slaves was what was giving you your wealth mm -hmm. um you know they were human property talking about property and the concept of mortgage as it you know as it as it's kind of born comes out of the trading of slaves um not of real estate 
And, you know, the fact that this became an international financial system, you know, really speaks about how sophisticated and organized and premeditated the nature of this of this trading, you know, has. Um, uh, so you they were issuing bonds here in the southern states, but then you had people. So you know, after the slave bonds were mortgaged and people were highly in debt, what the first banks did was to kind of group these bond, group these mortgages and this debt and issue bonds. And then these bonds were bought out in markets in Hamburg, you know, the main markets, Hamburg, um, London, Philadelphia, Boston. So even though, for example, the slave uh, slavery was not legal anymore in some of these places, people were still benefiting from the slave trade and the slave economy down in the South, you know, as a way to keep their hands clean, of course, you know. And and, and this it's this culture of acquiring wealth without working, you know, um, growing it at all costs, uh, you know, abusing of the powerless, that has brought us the panic of 1837 when was when this you know first bank crash and these bonds came you know failed and the cotton industry failed. It brought us the stock market crash of 1927, the recession of 2008, and the recession we're living today. So I know that there's a culture of acquiring wealth without working and on the backs of slaves and of the vulnerable that has built this country. Uh, and, you know, there is definitely a conversation to be had about reparations, about wealth distribution, about land restitution to indigenous peoples in the United States. And this will be the only way, the only way I see uh, to come out of, of this um, pitfall that we are right now. And, you, and as you mentioned it, I, I, we've had a lot of questions about, about the ways in which slave trade and bonds historically have been linked. Another one of our attendees was asking about, there is a marker on the Delaware River in Philadelphia, which is a monument to Philadelphia's history in the slave trade. And they were asking about whether either of you can envision other water related monuments that other, either coming out of those histories or other histories that could sort of shift our relationship and our understanding of the history of these rivers. Yes, but I would I would think I would say that we would have to rethink the idea of monument too. Um, and you know, I think that's already a conversation that's happening, you know, when um, during the the uprisings and the protests, uh, you know, framed by Black Lives Matter and the tearing down of offensive statues. Um, you know, and already these actions are already contesting this idea of monuments. Do we need another kind of phallic centric monument? Do we need one? Or what are the kind of monuments that we want to build? Um, I Can I suggest one thing, at least for the Schuylkill and, um, I mean, this whole region is a wetlands. Yeah. Um, so restoring the wetlands might be the best monument. And, and um, uh, um, repairing all of the, I mean, the centuries of damage that's been done by, by the oil industry along the South Google. Mm, yeah. Um, like completely, uh, you know, and then also um, another monument might be um, to um, provide um, uh, free healthcare to all of the people that live in Point Breeze and Grace Ferry who have been, you know, who are lit. I mean, basically Point Breeze is Cancer Alley of, of Philadelphia. Yeah, and it's interesting what you mentioned, Mary, because all, all of what you mentioned has to do with healing, you know, restoring is healing. So maybe we, we have to stop thinking in terms of monumentality and also as artists, you know, that have been associated to the construction and the envisioning of these monuments, and maybe it's more productive at this point, you know, through the art, through the art practice. Think about processes of healing instead of monumentality, and healing in in practices are are maybe more intimate, smaller, or maybe even more more bold, like you you suggest, like universal health care for all for all, you know, at least or at least for those who have been more impacted now. Well, certain... I actually do think universal health care for everyone. <laughs> <Me too>. But, <laughs> like, but uh, you, know, you can start somewhere, you know, you can yeah. start somewhere. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to kind of point out. 
I wonder also if Mary, when you were talking about the urban gardening as that as a form of healing that you could almost think of as a form of monument in terms of reducing the runoff to the Schuylkill in terms of thinking about making these sort of yeah. slow healing processes. To the and side. also, I mean, one of the great things about um, the um, food justice agricultural movement in Philadelphia is that, you know, the soil, the, um, there's a very conscious effort to like remediate the soils because the soils are, have heavy metals in them from this heavy and this you know centuries of of industry um which uh you know they use the plants to actually extract pull up the 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 metals that are you know poisoning our bodies um and then you know the food itself is feeding people in neighborhoods that don't have access to land to water to food, uh, healthy food themselves. Um, so, you know, it's like this, it's more than just, you know, remed um, controlling kind of rain runoff. I mean, it's an entire um, permaculturally, you know, ecological kind of restorative process in, in these neighborhoods. Carolina, when you were making distressed debt and thinking about the fabric panels, were you thinking about a sort of healing or anti-monumentality when you were when you were using that as the medium in order to think about the notion of of utility bonds? Mm, I was thinking about different processes and financial processes that are um, a, a little bit difficult to grasp for me as somebody that's not an economist. You know, all the financial terms and financial structures and the way it functions um, is a bit confusing to me. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, you know, financial, like transnational capital and capital works that way, you know, it's, it's changing, you know, corporations are changing name all the time, financial terms or financial systems are, are complicated by nature. And I think it's, it's um, totally, uh, you know, something that is done totally, you know, in, 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 in knowledge that it's difficult for the layman to understand precisely to hide, to be able to move capital and to be, become more difficult to be held accountable, for example, mm -hmm. I think so, you know. Um, so I wanted a fabric that could be, so one of the fabrics that is silk is very see-through, you know, so it's kind of the money is there, but it's not there or it can disappear, it depends on where you're standing. You can see it more clearly or you cannot see it more clearly. So that was the decision of using a little bit that, that kind of fabric and then fabric in general also in fact you know kind of you can wash fabric you cannot wash paper you can wash fabric and I was thinking more about financial um, uh, movements that are destined to to laundry money or to laundry capital too and I'm thinking about the vulture hedge funds that I was thinking about or the bottom feeders no the fact that these pieces could actually go through a washing machine or be you know be put in water um i find fabric i've used fabric in other series before um and i i really enjoy the malleability it gives to me the possibility of having it installed in different ways or the possibility of activating it so i you know i wouldn't um, discharge the possibility of activating those panels in a more performatic way or lecture performance way in the future, which is hopefully soon, you know, when we can resume right. <laughs> closer contact. Um, so that was a little bit the decision kind of leaving. I, I feel that when something is printed on paper, it, it's given a status, um, kind of a museum status, you know, it becomes more precious, less, ha like you can't hand it that well, unless it's actually no bills that we handle every day you know but you know even the bonds that I bought um, to to kind of scan and create this collages the way they were shipped to me they were like you know in, in archivally shipped and whatnot there's a preciousness to paper and I wanted to avoid that precisely and and fabric is a much more playful surface that you can subject to different distresses if you wanted which you know um, allows me also to envision a piece with several lives and with several steps. So now these panels are there, but doesn't mean that it's gonna be installed the same or doesn't mean that I can't kind of, you know, go back to them and print over them again, or maybe cut through them or, you know, so that's that's why, why that decision of fabric. Mm. Absolutely. 
I'm just curious, what was it like for you as somebody who thought so deeply about the very notion of what it meant to hold a bond, to buy a bond, to purchase and receive those archival bonds? I mean, you mentioned the preciousness of them, but is there was there sort of some strange, uncanny feeling that went into that transaction for you? Very morbid, actually. <laughs> But most of these most of these bonds are already um, decommissioned, so they don't have any stock value or anything like that. They're more collectibles, no. Mm -hmm. And there's always a morbidity behind collecting something, and you know the fact that these had certain sort of value or represent, or maybe you know that they represent taxes of, of the Puerto Rican people, the people from Philadelphia that were blown away by their you know their by their government or their administrations. It's very morbid to actually hold them and, and you know this piece of paper at one point was blowing away the resources or the yeah the, the capital resources of of the people of puerto rico and you know the most more the more morbid ones are the ones from puerto rico you know because you can see really the colonial structure living through the visuals so there was a lot of like plantation visuals um in in a lot of those bonds and stocks that i bought from puerto rico mm -hmm. So it's very morbid, and and on the other hand, they're very they're very luscious. They're very pretty. You know, they are printed in a way with some sort of texture. You know, the intrinsic intricacy of of the you know stamps and seals and ornates are are very beautiful. You know, I'm fascinated by them. Um, so so it's very paradoxical to actually see them and find them beautiful, but know that they represent this this kind of um, privatization of common goods and common resources. So it's very paradoxical. And, and Mary, I also wanted to think a little bit about, you're a scholar, you're not a practicing artist per se, but you clearly have this photographic practice as you're going along the river, you're sort of collecting these memories and these encounters that you're having. I'd love to hear just a little bit about how you think about photography and sort of image making as part of that and why you're sort of drawn to one of that as one of the ways in which to, to gather this knowledge. Um, so this is so funny. I, w I don't know that my, my phone camera, I just don't know <laughs> if I could even call myself a photographer. I mean, I don't know, honestly, um, the photographs that I take, um, and I, I pretty much am taking photographs every day mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I visit the river or I visit the woodlands. It's, I, you know, I honestly, it's something about, um, maybe it is about memory for me. Um, I, I think there is something kind of unca the uncanniness of um, what I'm looking at and trying to come maybe capture in, in my image making, if you can call it that. Um, but it's more, yeah, I, I don't know that I can actually really articulate um, wh what the photographs do for me. Um, I mean, I have to be honest with you, um, other than sharing a, a, a walk with um, people from Beta Local um, a few years ago, these are things that I do completely alone. And these are, um, this is like, I of sharing uh, with this kind of large, larger public, this kind of very private and quiet thing that I do um, every day. And so the photographs, yeah, they're really for me to kind of capture um, all of what I, you know, my thoughts and feelings about what the river means um, and how we are kind of um, that we flow through this, uh, that commodities and, and we are commodities and the history of commodities flowing through um, uh, through the river and, and kind of seeing the, you know, in a strange way, Carolina, maybe this is like, I definitely, every time I go to the, the river, I see these overlays of stories and histories in my mind you know, and, um, and that is kind of part of the practice, uh, you know, that I, I keep when I'm sitting next to the river, I literally will look and try to see back and forward um, through time in um, when I'm looking 
um, across the, the banks of the river. Um, and so maybe the photographs are in some way trying to capture that and that weird uncanniness of it. I don't know. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, like when, when I personally take photographs and I think, you know, the way you are showing your photographs, Mary, when you take photographs of a river or film a river or when I do it at least, you know, for me, it's a way to relate to that river. It's the way I build a relationship to that river. You know, it's not to represent it of any sorts, you know, and actually I'm in the process of unlearning representation of nature through the way I, you know, present then bodies of water. But I think, you know, those tools, those technologies are together with ritual, together with swimming in the river, together <laughs> with fishing, these are ways that we relate to the river, you know, they're not just image capturing, they're building a relationship between ourselves, like you, and uh, the, that body of water in particular. And, and, and what resonated a lot of, of, like, when you say that, you know, you see this overlap in histories, I think, in that terms, art, uh, you know, art making, image making is also a great tool to think about the construction of historical memory and the construction specifically about environmental historical memory, which is so important today. Yeah, no, thank you, Carol, for kind of ad, kind of articulating better than I um, about kind of that, you know, my practice, I mean, really it is like a meditative practice to kind of meditate on these relationships that I see that I am, my body, I am connected to, you know, the river and all of this, and it's, it's a practice. Uh -oh. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you both so much for your time. I, I am conscious that we're running over both of um, the panel time and I want to be conscious of your time and also the audience's time. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you to Carolina. Thank you to Mary. Thank you to all of our translators. Um, yes, thank more, you. <laughs> thank you to you both. For, for more information on the Commonwealth Project, um, there's information at all three of the institutional web websites, um, Betelo Call, ICA VCU, and Philadelphia Contemporary. And there will also be a recording of this talk that will be made available online for anyone who wasn't able to make it in person or yeah. in person on time. So thank you all both so much for your time. I just wanted to add quickly that I dropped a few resources in the chat too about Esprosi and um, artists rethinking monument monumentality. So hopefully you have a chance to just access those. Thank yes, you. Can I also just say in Philadelphia, of course, um, the Monument Lab was kind of founded here. So um, a big project that is rethinking monuments, so. Um. Monument Lab actually um, was, uh, Paul Farber was one of the participants in our first panel. So also oh, if, anyone to, if anyone wants to hear more about Monument Lab and their relationship to, the, to these themes also, um, please check out that talk as well. They're, they do fantastic work, there's no doubt. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, um, Mary, so much. Have a good afternoon. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you all so thank very much. Carolina, thank you. Um, all, everyone, thank you all for, for this. Thank you all and take care. <laughs>